Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens webinar, Let's Talk Gardens. We have a terrific lineup for you today, or terrific presentation, I should say. Uh, Jonathan Cavalier is here with us. Jonathan is the Director of Horticulture at Dumbarton Oaks. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy the images that he's going to show you and tell you more about the history behind this beautiful, wonderful estate. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Education and Collections Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and it's been my pleasure to work with Jonathan at the past. He's worked for Smithsonian Gardens and then got pulled over to Dumbarton. But as always, please put your questions in the chat box and follow along for any resources that Zach puts in the box. And we will ask Jonathan questions at the end of his presentation. So without further ado, Jonathan, we love to hear more about Beatrix and what she did at Dumbarton and what she continues to do in her spirit. So thank you for joining us today. I'm going to disappear and I will see you at the end of the presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you, albeit virtually. Um, I really look forward to a time when we can get together and all be uh, together in person, preferably in the gardens. Um, but uh, today I am uh, really pleased to share with you some of the magic of Dumbarton Oaks and Beatrix Ferrand. It's a special moment for us at Dumbarton Oaks this year as we are celebrating the centennial of the gardens, starting from Beatrix Ferrand's first visit to the property in the summer of 1922. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to share with you some background on Beatrix Ferrand so that you can better appreciate our mission to preserve her design legacy at Dumbarton Oaks. And then I'll share with you some of the challenges and opportunities that we consider as we look forward to the next hundred years of preservation and evolution of these gardens. Um, the presentation is about 30 minutes, and then I'm happy to uh, answer questions and just talk in general, uh, everything Dumbarton Oaks and Beatrix Ferrand afterwards. Um, but before I jump in, I do wanna uh, quickly thank Smithsonian Gardens and all those working behind the scenes for hosting these virtual sessions throughout the pandemic. Uh, they certainly have been a lifeline for me and I know lots of gardeners have enjoyed uh, the content and just the ability to participate virtually since we can't all be together. So, okay, to begin, uh, Dumbarton Oaks is a Harvard Research Center focusing on Byzantine, pre-Columbian and garden and landscape studies. It is a home for the humanities, a research library, a museum, and a steward of 16 acres of Beatrix Farron Design Gardens, largely considered the best preserved of her works and a crowning achievement of her career. At Dumbarton Oaks, Beatrix Farron uh, ingeniously combined formal French and Italian design aesthetics with those of English cottage styles and the American landscape movement to create a unique space that combines formality and informality, symmetry and, and asymmetry, and really seamlessly folds the designed landscape uh, into the existing topography, creating an intimate and awe-inspiring effect. Farron's attention to detail in designing everything from plantings and hardscapes to furniture and other garden ornament along with her genius in concealing and then surprisingly revealing axes and points of interest are a lasting testament to her great skill as a landscape designer. Perhaps most impressively, Farron broke through established gender barriers in a male dominated field, just as landscape architecture was being defined and standardized as a professional discipline. And she certainly left her mark as a leader in the practice. So a little history, um, Beatrix uh, Cadwallader Jones, uh, she certainly benefited from her social standing and, and wealth. Uh, she was born in 1872 in New York and um, uh, Beatrix Jones, as in um, keeping up with the Joneses, that was her family. Um, so, you know, she grew up in a household where her parents socialized with the Morgans, the Roosevelt's, the Rockefellers, uh, among other members of the East Coast elite. Her aunt, uh, the American author Edith Wharton, was an active mentor and influence on Beatrix, even after Wharton's brother, Beatrix's father, left the family when Beatrix was young. And it was Wharton, actually, who gave uh, Beatrix some of her first landscape uh, gardening commissions. 
So this access to wealth and social standing, it certainly allowed Farron to follow her passion for plants at a time when educational opportunities for women in the field were almost non-existent. Outside of educational uh, opportunities through the land-grant colleges, which weren't considered entirely accurate or adequate to complete a professional education. So through family connection, she studied under Charles Sprague Sargent, the founding director of the Arnold Arboretum, and she was able to hire professors from Columbia University to privately tutor her in subjects such as drafting, surveying, and mathematics. Under Sargent and indirectly through Olmsted, who was working with Sargent to lay out the Arnold Arboretum, Farron learned botany, horticulture, and the basic principles of design. And she was encouraged to study landscape paintings to, as Sargent put it, learn from all the great arts as all art is akin. Sargent further encouraged Farron to embark on a grand tour of European gardens, uh, which she did in 1893. On these travels, Farron uh, studied famous gardens in Italy, France, Germany, and England, and kept a journal documenting her experiences, parts of which were later published as the collected writings of Beatrix Farrand. Farrand also met with accomplished designers such as Edward André in France, and in England, William Robinson, and of course, Gertrude Jekyll. These encounters and garden explorations all helped Farrand crystallize her design aesthetic and her approach to landscape gardening. In fact, uh, Farron was so inspired by Jekyll's writing and design work that she purchased all of Jekyll's working papers uh, after her death and subsequently donated them to the archives at the UC Berkeley, where they continue to serve as an important historical reference that could otherwise have been lost. Um, and as a side note, in 2019, I visited a 1908 uh, Jekyll garden in England that had been completely lost and then restored um, and is in a beautiful condition thanks to some really incredibly talented gardeners and they were able to access the design papers and drawings at the UC Berkeley, thanks to Farron's procurement and archiving of the papers. So while her privilege and social standing certainly allowed Farron to gain a first class self-directed education in landscape design, it was really her drive and attention to detail that facilitated her great success as a landscape gardener, uh, a title that she really preferred over the much abhorred title landscape architect. Upon returning from her travels in Europe, Farron started a practice in her mother's home in 1896. And using family connections to secure her first commissions, at the same time, she also began writing articles for publication. Through word of mouth and highly refined design work, Farron's reputation grew, and she soon built a successful professional practice, operating multiple offices and directing work throughout the country. She designed over 200 landscapes over the course of her career, including many large public works, such as the campuses at Princeton, Yale, Oberlin, the University of Chicago, the California Institute of Technology, as well as the first rose gardens at the White House and the New York Botanical Garden. Farron's practice was defined by its professionalism and modeled after that of Sargent and Olmsted. She hired only women and retained tight control over decision-making and design considerations. One thing that set her practice apart from others at the time was her insistence on maintaining client-funded accounts with which to purchase plants and pay gardeners and nursery workers. And this ensured greater control over plant selections and how the installations were carried out. She maintained accounting records for ongoing projects, keeping meticulous records for her clients and thereby instilling trust in her professionalism. And by the age of 27, she was the only female on the 11 member founding board of the American Society of Landscape Architects and a vocal thought leader at a time when the principles of the emerging practice were just being debated and standardized. She was fiercely independent and did not shy away from challenging norms, claiming that her quote, professional point of view is no different from that of any man's and that I'm thankful and proud to say that the men of my profession treat me as one of themselves. I've put myself through the same training and look to the same rewards. And I no more expect special consideration because of my sex than any woman painter or woman sculptor or woman anything else ought to. In another example, Farron challenged the accepted norm that women uh, to be referred to by their husband's surnames, even after taking Max Farron's name after their marriage in 1913. I'm to be put down as Beatrix Farron without any qualifying Mr. or Miss or Mrs. as I regard Beatrix Farron as a sort of trade name. 
I look to Farron's impact on the field of landscape architecture uh, as that of a trailblazer, providing a model and showing others how to build a practice. Her approach differed from that of other women at the time in that Farron did not actively mentor or collaborate with other female designers. In fact, she held no illusions as to the difficulty that women would face in this predominantly male field. In an article titled Landscape Architecture as a Profession for Women, which she wrote for the vocational conference at Bryn Mawr in 1916, Farron said, those of us who have known the profession the longest are usually said to be the most deterrent to young women who wish to enter it. My own feeling is that no woman should attempt it without realizing how little suited it is to us in many ways. The work is physically hard, the hours long and traveling incessant, and steady nerves and a good temper are quite as important to the landscape gardener as a sense of color or design. So through Farron, we see the path of a determined and exceptionally talented woman who, through her relentless passion for and motivation, helped break down some of the gender barriers that were so prevalent in the emerging field of landscape architecture in the early 20th century. And fortunately, she also left us with some lasting beautiful gardens to enjoy for the future. And now with a better understanding of Farron's philosophy and design aesthetic, one is able to really appreciate the gardens and the changes that have occurred over the past century in a whole new light. While some changes have been made to reinforce infrastructure and facilitate, it, facilitate a transition to a pri from a private garden in the Bliss era to an institutional garden in the Harvard era, other changes have occurred as the gardens have matured and philosophies towards particular plants or tree stewardship, for example, have evolved. And while some of the particular plants have changed, the structure, the layers, detailing, and essence of the gardens are largely intact. Sadly, this is only the case for a couple of Farron gardens out of the 200 some gardens and landscape that she created during the course of her career. All the more reason to celebrate the centennial of her work at Dumbarton Oaks. And so this year, we celebrate the past and the future. And it couldn't come at a better time when most folks I talk to are so grateful for green spaces and looking forward to any time, any opportunity to be outdoors and to be in gardens. Throughout the course of this year, we're planning a number of exhibits, uh, events, and other public engagements to celebrate the gardens and Farron's legacy. Some exhibits and engagements are already up in the gardens, such as this one in the catalog house, which features archival drawings and photographs of gardens and gardeners, along with Farron's drawings. And other exhibits such as our museum exhibit, A Century in the Gardens, are actually opening this weekend. We have on our uh, centennial page, uh, which Smithsonian Gardens is gonna share a link in the chat. Um, it's www.dokes.org backslash event backslash gardens hyphen centennial. Uh, there are several online experiences such as timelines, diligently researched and designed and compiled by our Garden and Landscape fel Studies postgraduate fellows. Uh, these timelines are great. They walk you through graphically um, many different areas and iconic spaces throughout the gardens over time. You can examine historic photographs, drawings, and other archival materials that have been digitized and cataloged so that you can help contextualize the design and, and evolutions of the historic spaces throughout time. There's also a section called Writing in the Gardens, or Writing the Gardens rather. Um, and this is a collection of thought pieces about the gardens from varying perspectives. And finally, we're very excited to release two new books this year as part of a cent our centennial celebrations. The first, which I had the real pleasure of editing is a republishing of Beatrix Farron's plant book for Dumbarton Oaks. In this work, Farron describes her design intent and shares her vision for future maintenance and the evolution of the gardens. The new edition should be out this summer and includes updated commentary and photography while retaining Farron's words and plant lists. And a shameless plug, my mom did the photography. The second book, edited by our Director of Garden and Landscape Studies and my dear friend and colleague, Thaisa Wei, is uh, it's a features four seasons of garden photography by uh, Sahar Kostin Hardy and a selection of essays exploring the history design and significance of the gardens, again, from diverse perspectives. This book also will be out this summer. So 
While it's important for us to celebrate the beauty of these historic spaces, the dedication of those who care for them, um, the centennial is also an opportunity to look ahead into the next century. Maintaining a historic garden such as Dumbarton Oaks is a difficult business uh, with its tricky topography, unforgiving access, and intricate de detailing. At the same time, these challenges also present opportunities for us to improve and to ensure that the gardens remain relevant in a modern horticultural context over the next century. Following Farron's spirit of constant evolution as a guiding principle, we're focused on improving ecosystem services, stormwater management, and plant diversity, while still maintaining Farron's design intent and preserving the ornament and other architectural element. And now I'd like to share with you some examples of, and of opportunities and challenges, uh, beginning with the complex issue of invasive plant management and ecosystem services. While Farron was certainly a proponent of native plants, as evidenced by her gardening at her Reef Point home in Maine and other, other projects she did during the course of her career, she did utilize a number of non-natives at Dumbarton Oaks, and several of these are now considered invasive. So it's a real challenge for us uh, in maintaining design integrity while we are also channeling Farron's spirit of the, uh, as the plant palette evolves. Here you see a recent renovation. This is Urn Terrace that I'll come back to in a minute. Again, we're fortunate uh, in the richness of the archives and in Farron's writings, as we feel like we have a good understanding of her philosophy regarding plant succession and uh, plant use in the gardens. Farron's approach, very much inspired by Gertrude Jekyll's technique of painting with plants, was to use plants in distinct roles to fill a function, serving their individual role in service towards the greater design. And if a plant wasn't pulling its weight, Farron would replace mm -hmm. it. And there are numerous instances throughout the correspondence between her and Mrs. Bliss and in the plant book where she talks about uh, the potential need for future substitutions and the importance of scale and color and texture uh, over particular plant varieties. Um, so in understanding this philosophy, it gives us the courage to make plant substitutions and to steward the garden's evolution. Most recently, as I said, our focus has been on invasive plants. Uh, and this was really following a 2018 Harvard Graduate School of Design interns work on a project entitled Reinterpreting Farron. For this project, our fantastic intern cataloged all the invasive plants currently in the gardens and then cross-referenced them with Farron's plant lists. She also made a field guide and conducted some case studies of particular areas or particular plants to assess opportunities. So here's a case study from Joan's project. Um, this one focuses on Urn Terrace, um, formerly called Box Terrace after the boxwood. Uh, on the left, you see Farron's original design, and on the right, a later alteration overseen by Ruth Havey, who was Farron's protege and project manager at Dumbarton Oaks. Um, this space is one of many that received changes in the transition from a private garden to an institutional campus, as I mentioned earlier. And changes here included the bricking over of grass pathways, the alteration of bed lines, the replacement of boxwood with English ivy, and ground cover with turf grass, and the addition of a pebble mosaic apron around the urn, uh, which actually served as a mock-up for the later pebble garden, which was also designed by Ruth Havey. Um, also, if you notice in the background, you'll see the uh, Japanese wisteria in the background, and you'll see English ivy um, hugging the wall uh, as well. So um, here's a picture of the restoration. Soon after planting, this is in 2019, and you can see the turf grass was replaced with Mazes Reptans, uh, substituting for Farron's original Vinca Minor. Um, the boxwood was brought back, albeit with a different variety. We're using Buxus Little Missy here instead of English boxwood um, because we are combating boxwood blight in the gardens. So we're actually doing some in situ trials of several different resisting cultivars. And uh, this one is performing very well. Um, you also notice we left the English ivy on the walls and we left the wisteria. Um, and, you know, Farron writes about these extensively throughout the plant book. Um, here, these plants can be managed through seed management and making sure that they all stay in their lanes. Um, in fact, the English ivy was a really interesting case study for our intern because Farron used it liberally throughout the garden in many different ways. Um, so in this case of Urn Terrace, where English ivy was used as a bedding plant, 
um, by, by Ruth Havey after Ferrand, uh, the decision was really easy to, to revert back to the boxwood. Um, in the case when English ivy is used as an architectural accent on the walls or as a sturdy ground cover on a two to one slope of which we have several, um, then it's a more difficult nuanced decision. Um, and you know the same would apply for the other iconic plants throughout the gardens, the wisteria, um, the, the other uh, um, uh, plants that we have. Um, and you know, with, with regards to the wisteria, um, we have plenty. <laughs> we have, uh, it was one of favorite, Farron's favorite plants as well as Miss Bliss. And there are iconic sections throughout the garden, including the North Vista, around the Pebble Garden and surrounding the Orangery um, that, are, that are planted extensively with uh, both Japanese and Chinese wisteria. Um, we do have uh, a single American wisteria representative outside of Fountain Terrace, but um, that was a later addition. And all the historic plantings of, uh, of wisteria are, um, are Chinese and, and Japanese. Um, and in fact, the wisteria is so iconic, it was even included in a collection of forever stamps issued in 2020 by the US Postal Service uh, to celebrate American gardens. And so our treatment strategy for this plant has been to leave it in place um, to attempt to prune seed pods where possible before they split, and then certainly to rogue out volunteers as we see them in the gardens. Here's another example. Um, in this example, I'll share with you a story of reclamation. Um, here you can see a very young Malassans Allee, complete with uh, Farron's rulers in the background that were marking out a spot for a possible but never realized urn. Um, this picture is taken even before construction of the charming path that skips through the LA, connecting the Lover's Lane pool to the herbaceous borders and kitchen gardens below. And you see here the, the um, LA of silver maples that was originally planted. Um, here's a view of the same path last summer. And uh, notice the privet obscuring the LA line on the right. Um, the buffer here between that LA line and the edge of the property varies between about 10 and 20 feet along a run of several hundred feet down the length of the LA. Uh, and uh, that buffer, like I said, it's about 10 to 20 feet before it meets a chain link fence above a, about a 15 foot high retaining wall to the lover's lane below. Um, so here there's a desire to maintain intimacy of the LA as Farron envisioned it. And we have a very narrow uh, buffer up against the property edge, um, which is the buffer is loaded with invasives. Um, so in 2020, we started a project to reclaim this buffer in a phased approach that would be sensitive to the intimacy of the LA and then also to the gardener's capacity to take on large projects, um, especially during COVID when we lost about 40% of our labor hours due to um, you know, having to spread out and, and, um, and alter our, our days in and, and so forth. Um, so the first phase involved removing enough invasives to provide planting space. Um, next, the gardeners planted about 150 native shrubs um, we used a, a good list, including Lindera, um, Ilex reticulata, Cephalanthus, Itea, Viburnum dentatum. Um, and then this season, we plan to remove the last of the invasives from the buffer and add an evergreen layer, um, including Morella and Magnolia virginiana. Uh, we're actually going to try the new sweet thing uh, dwarf cultivar of, of uh, Magnolia virginiana that seems to be uh, a plant that'll perform and, and give us the, the size and scale that we're looking for back in this buffer. Uh, and once, once the restored buffer is grown in a bit, then we're going to remove the last of the privet from the front of the LA line and be able to restore that historic view. Um, there are many other challenges involving invasives, um, such as maintaining an acre of pristine forsythia on a steep slope under pressure from porcelain berry, bittersweet, um, and uh, the dreaded bindweed as well. Um, and reinforcing the buffer plants throughout the property will, will certainly aid in mitigating some of this constant pressure. Um, tree secession is another challenge that, uh, especially considering that many of the iconic spaces in this garden are so magical because of the trees which grace them. Um, also compounding this challenge is the topography and the access throughout the gardens with most of the gates measuring about 32 inches and lots of steps and uneven terrain. It's often hard to tell to plant a tree larger than a two inch caliper. Here you see a beach uh, on Beach Terrace, uh, which Farron reworked her wall um, for this terrace in order to minimize impact to the existing European beach that was there at the time. Uh, unfortunately, the beach tree was lost in the 1950s 
and was replaced with this current American beech shown here, um, which has really grown an impressive and uncharacteristically open form to fill the space. So because of the patience needed in planting smaller trees, uh, a new tree is sometimes planted before the tree it is meant to replace has fully declined, uh, as long as it doesn't significantly impact the design. Here you can see one of the oldest trees on the property. Uh, this is a pre-Bliss era Magnolia denudata that Miss Bliss and Ferrand referred to as the bride because of the, the beautiful white flowers. Um, and though this tree has been declining slowly, it still tells a great story. And I'm encouraged, I see the suckers at the base and, and I, I, uh, I think that's a hint at a possible next chapter. So, um, so we keeping this tree around, it doesn't pose a risk. Um, it's, it's a really unique, interesting story. Um, but you can see in the background, nonetheless, um, there's its replacement slash companion tree that was planted about 15 years ago uh, in anticipation of the decline of this tree. So um, I guess in some cases, every other generation of tree will be in the correct location. But sometimes an iconic tree, uh, or in this case, a grove of trees must be replaced in a more exacting manner, uh, as was the case with the ellipse hornbeams in 2019. This double hedge of American hornbeams designed by Alden Hopkins in the mid 1960s replace, um, replaced an elliptical hedge of American boxwood that Farrand had designed for the space. But with its decline, she noted the entire ellipse would need reworking after careful study, which she never got around to. And so the, um, so the Alden Hopkins design was implemented in the 60s. Um, and the original Hopkins hornbeams had severely declined by 2018, with only about 41 of the 76 original trees remaining. Uh, these trees are trained in a particular form, so replacements were custom grown at Ramelton Farms in Maryland in order to meet the specification of eight feet of clear trunk with a uniform crown for future training. So this project actually started in 2013, thanks to my predecessor and long-term garden director, Gail Griffin, who uh, began this process by contract growing the trees. Um, then in the course of, the, of our planning for the, for the planting project, uh, soil analysis revealed a contributing factor towards the tree decline, a compacted soil with little biological activity. So we undertook a project of soil blending ahead of the tree replacement uh, using a combination of in-house and contracted support. Uh, first, about 300 cubic yards of soil was excavated and sorted with the best half retained for custom soil mixing. We consulted with T. Fleischer and Andrea Philippone from F2 Environmental Design on the soil spec and the mixing process. And here you can see Mark Vetter and I uh, assessing our mixing job with T. Fleischer. It was really important for us to do the soil mixing portion ourselves because we wanted to learn the science and the process uh, for future projects. So after conducting percolation tests to assure that the subsoils were well draining, uh, we installed a sand base and then we added our custom mix in lifts, taking care to mix it in with the sand base to prevent layering. And then came time for the arrival of the 86 new hornbeam trees, 76 for the ellipse planting and 10 for an additional, 10 additional backups that were planted in an on-site nursery. Um, and Ramelton Farms graciously uh, kept another 10 at their nursery for backups, um, which amazingly, we've, we've had zero loss on these trees, so we've not needed any of the backups. Um, and here's a picture after three years and several applications of compost tea, the trees are really well established. Uh, in fact, this winter, the gardeners just gave them their first dormant structural pruning to begin to train the, the uh, head shape. Um, we also planted the beds underneath the trees with Isotoma fluviatilis, uh, blue star creeper, um, this was a design departure from the pea gravel that Alden Hopkins had used, and it was a change that we feel better is better for the trees um, and also still provides a reflective ground cover accent, especially in the spring when the isotoma is covered in blue flowers. Um, they, they're not shown in this picture because we just did the planting uh, this summer. Um, of course, not all the interventions are as fun as removing invasives or renovating iconic spaces that have naturally declined. Sometimes the challenge involves accessing, repairing, or replacing old infrastructure while minimizing impact to the landscape and the historic fabric. Such was the case in 2017 to 2018 when the gardens were closed for an entire year 
during an irrigation and stormwater improvement project that was necessitated by the failure of a hundred year old water supply line, which impacted a significant portion of the gardens. Of course, the sensitivities in the garden regarding heritage trees, topography, and um, sensitive architectural element, uh, because of all of that, great care was taken uh, to mitigate damage, um, such as directional boring you see over on the, on the left, and then um, air spade trenching for new pipe runs to minimize impact to the trees. We also followed a very circuitous route of uh, water pipe through the gardens to avoid major trees. Entire fountains and pools were dismantled in order to transform them from fresh feed systems that drain into the storm system into recirculating systems. And the brick path traversing Melisande's LA was lifted to accommodate the new irrigation mainline, that being the spot furthest away from the LA trees. Significant repairs and upgrades to compromised stormwater pipes and inlets necessitated wide swaths of forsythia to be removed from the forsythia dell. But thankfully, after planting hundreds of young forsythia propagated from the dell and four years of relentless weeding, the planting has recovered. And it's looking like it's gonna be a beautiful flower display in a couple of weeks. We had very little loss in the gardens and they've actually recovered very well over the past few years. Um, we were even honored this past year to be featured in the September issue of Vogue with a Ferrand inspired photo shoot in the gardens, a real honor. And finally, we focus our attention strategically on the ornament and architectural element throughout the gardens, the vast majority of which that was designed by Farron. In fact, Farron designed a significant collection of unique furniture, gates, arbors, finials, and other elements that we are actively and systematically preserving and restoring over the next decade. As in her garden design, Farron was inspired in her ornament by Gertrude Jekyll, Armand Rateau, Andre Lenotre, and in the case of, as in the case of the arbor on Ar Arbor Terrace shown above, um, she also tweaked. A, a, she also would often tweak a detail and make a piece her own, uh, such as the playfully asymmetrical roof lines for the ace for the symmetrically laid out sheds in the kitchen gardens. For the furniture, um, we embarked on a project several years ago with a local uh, furniture designer to create 3D computer models that can be used for reproduction using a trusted furniture maker with an FSC certified teak plantation and workshop in Costa Rica. The modeling project eliminated the need to send these one of a kind Farron pieces off site. And I'm sure you can imagine the difficulty I had in uh, phone conversations with Harvard, trying to ensure a falling apart bench that's a one of a kind Farron design. So it's really nice to be able to uh, reproduce these pieces of furniture from the, from the models now. Um, so we've been steadily reproducing furniture every year and we're in the midst of actually a large project to tackle several pieces at once. For the fixed ornaments, the challenges are, are different. Um, the, you know, we're talking about working in a sensitive way to preserve and restore elements without damaging the gardens. Um, and with the difficult topography and access, uh, it makes it all the more difficult for our, for our preservation contractors to get the, the work done. Uh, one example recently completed during the pandemic was the re restoration of the 15 columns surrounding the Lover's Lane pool. Farron was inspired by her design for Lover's Lane Pool by the outdoor theater at the Bosco Parasio in Rome, uh, the home of the Arcadian Literary Society. It's shown below the flagstone courtyard with amphitheater seating, very reminiscent of the amphitheater seating and pool that Farron created at Dumbarton Oaks. And certainly an outdoor theater was appropriate for the Blisses who were music lovers and famously commissioned a piece by Igor Stravinsky to celebrate their 30th wedding anniversary. The 15 columns, at Lover's Lane with their connecting chains and finial urns were really in critical condition. Uh, many of the columns were leaning and wobbly with cracking throughout efflorescence at the base and two columns were missing urns completely. So through this project, we were able to recast two new urns from originals. We were also able to stabilize and underpin the columns, clean and consolidate the stone and add breakaway links to the chains, uh, the connecting chains for safety reasons. So this was a really, it was a great project. It was the first in a series of, of recent preservation projects aimed at architectural and ornament uh, uh, throughout the gardens. 
Um, following a comprehensive survey that we conducted in 2019, where we assessed and prioritized over 250 pieces of, of architectural and, and ornament uh, in the gardens. Um, so this survey really was helpful because it allowed us to prioritize and you know which, which pieces are in the most critical condition and then to plan over many years um, to, to facilitate a, a strategic um, approach. So um, we'll be continuing systematically. This was the first project um, and we'll be you know really chipping away at this over the next decade throughout the gardens. Um, looking ahead to the next large project, um, we recently have produced models for, um, uh, recently produced models, 3D models for the um, arbors, iconic arbors and gates throughout the garden, um, and planning a project to uh, rebuild some of these and then restore others that are in decent shape but, um, but need some work. So um, that's going to be a big project. And, uh, you know, as we get into the next hundred years, as we, as we go through the ornament, um, the the uh, the last thing we look forward to is really just um, fine tuning the plantings and really um, you know getting to the the icing of the cake uh, as I like to call it. Um, so with that, um, that about wraps it up for uh, for me. Um, it has been a real pleasure to share the gardens and Beatrix Farron with you all. Um, please visit the museum and gardens. We are open uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Uh, and uh, it, for the gardens and 11.30 um, to, to 5.30 for the museum. Um, the hours are all on our website um, and uh, the museum is free admission. Um, we have, we're doing time tickets for both the garden and the museum right now due to COVID. Um, and you can, you can pre-book that on our website. Um, and the museum centennial exhibit, A Century in the Gardens is actually opening this weekend. So um, please uh, come and visit. And with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, good. You made it. Uh, you, you, I, I don't mean to shut you down early for your slide, but I was so excited to get you on and to hear more about your work at Dumbarton. I forgot to advertise our orchid exhibit. So I want everyone that's in the audience that can to please come and visit uh, Smithsonian Gardens 2022 orchid exhibit. And it is absolutely gorgeous. And one of your most recent uh, uh, exhibits on Margaret Mee, she's included in this exhibit uh, for hidden uh, women, groundbreaking women, the hidden stories of groundbreaking women in uh, orchids. So we're very excited to have that up. And if you can't visit us downtown in the Kogog Courtyard, which is the courtyard between the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery, it is online as well. So you can see images, you can read the interpretive panels, and you can enjoy videos that we've created about the women that are featured. So that's my commercial. So thank you. I apologize for doing that a, a bit late. But you told so many good stories. Thank you. Beatrix is one of my favorite uh, uh, historical women. And I would say she's one of the best designers for ornament that I have ever seen and in the way that it fits into the garden itself. So with that, some of the questions are, um, what garden did you visit in England that was Beatrix design? Is it Dorothy ah. Streets by chance? Or um, I, Yeah, no, it, it's actually the uh, house at Upton is the garden oh. visited. And uh, it's actually not a public garden, um, but it is part of the, um, uh, what do they call it over there? The National Trust. So they do have some days that are open, uh, that they're open to the public, but um, it's owned by a couple that, that they're in their 70s now and they moved into this house in about 30 years ago and uh, and they just were avid gardeners and they they just they took it on themselves to rebuild this Jekyll garden and um, so although it's not a public uh, garden they they would welcome anyone who uh, who reached out to them and said they're a fan of, of uh, Beatrix Farron or Gucci Jekyll they spent two hours with me showing me around and it was a fantastic garden there's a book actually um, on the garden that uh, I don't have it with me other than show it, but uh, right. we can look it up and maybe Zach can yeah. find it. Some great gardens in England. Yeah, very much so. Uh, also, 
I know this isn't part of Dumbarton Oaks, but the uh, hill, the slope that you showed, that goes down into the more wild area, that's Dumbarton Parks, that has been being renovated for several years. Do you know the condition that it's in? Do you collaborate with them at all? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, actually, I didn't really talk about this in the talk, but you know, when the Blisses owned the property, it was it was about 50 acres of property that they had. Uh, when they donated the property to Harvard in 1941, they gave the upper gardens to Harvard, it's the 16 and a half acres that we have, and they donated about 27 acres to the National Park Service, um, which is now uh, part of the National Park Service, part of Rock Creek Park, it's Dumbarton Oaks Park, and uh, originally Farron designed all of that as one contiguous landscape, so you, you would start in the formal gardens and you would gradually find yourself down in a wilderness, but um, it was a designed wilderness with um, waterfalls that she added to widen the creek in places to make reflecting pools. She planted um, tons of bulbs and, and native shrubs, rhododendrons, azaleas, all kind of ericaceous plants. Um, and then she had some design meadows. And um, so when the property was split, you know, half of it is it's just on management technique, uh, different management protocols. And so um, it's challenging. Uh, th th they have a lot of challenges down there in the park because they've got a lot of runoff issues from the higher up areas, Wisconsin Avenue and the Naval Observatory and us as well. Um, so we do try and collaborate with them. We share plants. We, we sometimes pass a hose through the fence. Um, they've got a great army of volunteers, the DO Park Conservancy. If anyone's looking as interested in volunteering and you like invasive removal and, and some of that kind of more um, eco, you know, ecological restoration work. It's, it's a great group. And um, I think they've struggled during COVID, but uh, I'm seeing activity down there this spring. And I think they're talking about um, beefing up and replanting some of the Forsythia slope on their side of the fence. So we're going to try and help them with that as well. That's terrific. Uh, we love to coordinate and collaborate if we can. It's, it's tough because it's two different properties and, you know, we're, we're Harvard and that's National Park Service, but wherever we together and try and show the tie-in of those two landscapes we're always trying to do that that's great because that's just such a great example of one of her design principles of having things more formal up towards the house and then more wild the further you get away so you see that at green spring gardens it was mentioned in the uh, chat box green spring gardens which is in fairfax county over uh, off a of little river turnpike is another one of beatrix designs and you can see the same uh procession of very formal down to the very informal uh, at the bottom. The design isn't as uh, preserved as yours at Dumbarton, but you can still see hints of Beatrix here and there throughout the garden. It's, it is beautiful. Yeah. And so, that's something really she was very inspired by William Robinson um, and, and uh, you know, his, his work at Gravetime Manor and I mean, literally a thousand acre property with formal gardens around the house and the rest is pastoral. Uh, English countryside. It's it's uh, but designed, but um, it's very similar to both of our gardens, right? We sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you speak to Farron's relationship with the local craftspeople to be able to help create those beautiful ornaments? Do you know? Did she bring people in? Did she? Yes. Great designing? question. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't have a tremendous amount of detail, but I know that she was extremely hands-on in everything she did. So. Uh, you know, she would do planting plans and drawings, but then those were just really rough guides. She would go out with a handful, an armful of stakes and stake out all the um, locations. And then she would move stuff around. And there are stories of her moving stakes around and just driving the gardeners. Crazy. <laughs> but, uh, but then she'd be right out there digging with them. So, um, uh, you know, but she, um, she, she did, they did use local craftspeople. They, they, um, there was a, a gentleman named Frederick Cole who did most of the stonework and he did most of it on site on the property. There are a couple of archival photographs of, of a setup on the back side of the house with the sawhorses and whatnot and, and doing, uh, you know, stonework on the back of the house. So, um, you know, it, she was very much inspired by the arts and crafts movement. So um, I, she was very much in, interested in using local materials wherever possible. I think, you know, certainly the Blisses imported a lot of things. There was, there's marble furniture, there's, there are ornaments that they imported from France and bits of um, cast iron ornament and things that they would import and then copy and, and things like that. But a lot of the, particularly the stone cutting, the woodworking, a lot of that, it was done by local craftsmen on site 
Um, and Farron was very involved. She would, it was a very iterative process because the Blisses mostly were living abroad during the time that they owned this, this property. They, they owned the property from 1920 to 1941, and they only lived in the house for about seven years. Um, he was a diplomat, and so they spent most of their time abroad. And so while the gardens were being designed, Farron would, you know, for, for an urn, for example, she would sketch out maybe five or six different options and send them with a letter to Mrs. Bliss. And once Mrs. Bliss approved of one of them, she would then often make a full-scale mock-up out of plaster or paper and take pictures with rulers for scale and then send the pictures back to Ms. Bliss. And once that was approved, then they would actually make the final piece. Um, so it, it was very iterative. A lot of times the final piece that was made is different than the drawings or uh, because they would just tweak things as they went. Um, really fascinating process. That's so cool. Do you have any of those mock-ups? In there are some in the collection stories. There are a couple clay, uh, small scale clay mock-ups of like the horseshoe fountain and, and things like that, for example. Um, so, and we try and follow that same tradition. We, the stonemason that we use to do the repair of, of a lot of the stonework, uh, he's a contractor, but he's been working on the property since the mid nineties. And, you know, he's intimately familiar with all of this, all of the stone. He's, he knows exactly where he's been, what he's repaired, and he's a real artisan. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a sensitive, delicate, kind of slow and steady approach. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, that leads me to the next question. Have you ever thought about making copies and making them available to be sold? Uh, the we have. Copies? Oh, we have. Okay. <laughs> well, with the furniture, actually, in particular, because now that we've modeled the furniture, um, you know, I, I, I thought it might be nice for people to own a piece of Farron designed furniture. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to, to share Farron with, with a broader audience. So, um, we haven't put anything into plan yet, but it's something we've talked about, um, you know, because these are benches and some of them are quite large and, and obviously expensive. It would probably be something that people would would custom order or something like that. Mm -hmm. We would ever be able to to show them all. But um, but I would love that. I mean, I think her furniture is really amazing in the sense that all these pieces are they're one of a kind pieces and they were designed for the place that they are in. So it's really um, there, there are even two benches at the swimming pool that look almost identical, but one is four inches shorter than the other because it fits into this little niche that's a little shorter than the other niche. And so just the level of detail, um, you know, a curved back bench that fits perfectly into a little curved alcove and it, it, it really is special. Uh, yeah. I'd love to share that with people. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Uh, well, I'll look forward to it coming to Kmart soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Probably not at Kmart. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, so are you planning to replace the ivy under boxwood hedges? If so, with what? Yeah, um, we, we're, we're looking at the ivy in a very case-by-case -case situation. So, um, you know, we, it's, it's everywhere uh, throughout the gardens. Um, some of it was intentionally planted, some of it has escaped. Um, so, you know, if it's on a really steep slope that's holding ground, we're very hesitant to, to remove it um, because we already have a lot of erosion concerns and and um, and steep topography. Um, what we're working on right now is areas where it is on flatter areas or areas where it was added after Farrand or came in voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, that example on Urn Terrace was a really great example because it, it wasn't even a Farrand design. And so we're kind of getting back to a truer Farrand design while also removing English ivy. Um, but like English ivy on the walls, for example, I don't see it as a huge invasive problem because we keep it in a juvenile form. We, we, we never let it get to a mature form. We never see a flower on it. And if we did, we would, we would prune it off immediately. But, um, you know, she writes about it extensively, how important mm -hmm. her to clothe the walls and that the, she was very self-conscious about the scale of those walls because they're very, they're massive. I mean, the topography as you come down the terraces is such that you have these 15 foot tall retaining walls. And so she was really adamant about softening that with ivy in particular. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we, we're definitely looking at it. I think right now our primary focus is, uh, I think the privet is a big one because it reseeds itself everywhere. Um, and it's a big problem in the park and it's a big problem for us here. Uh, and then a lot of the vines, the, the, the bittersweet and the um, porcelain berry, those are really problematic for us as well. Barberry, um, some of those things that are that we see coming up. Um, but um, yeah, I would imagine, I mean, the, the, the short answer is we will probably always have English ivy here in the gardens to some extent, um, but um, we're going to do what we need to do to make sure we're not contributing to, to its spread. 
Mm -hmm. or your story is good to be able to share the story so people understand why the ivy is there right and, uh you know, probably discourage them from using it in their own gardens of course because of the oh for sure answer. i mean we don't many of us don't have our own private set of gardeners that will be out there pruning the flowers off so it's always very good uh to talk about it so what this is a great question, and I know you have a lovely library, but you have to tell us how we could get there, because I know some of Beatrix papers are at Dumbarton Oaks at the library. Is it open to the public? Can we yes. go and visit? Well, no, the library is a, is a research library. Okay. Um, so it's, it's pretty tightly controlled. It's actually a non-lending library, so we don't allow any materials to leave the library. Um, and the reason for that is it, it is really, it's, it's probably considered the best Byzantine library in the world. Um, so we have scholars kind of coming from all over the world to use, to use it, um, Byzantine scholars, pre-Columbian scholars, garden and landscape scholars. You can apply to become a reader. Um, and if you get a reader's badge, you can come and use the library materials in the library. Um, we have curtailed readers during COVID because our primary focus has been our on-site scholars and allowing them access. And so, um, but we really, I hope that we are going to be able to open it back up to readers in the future. Um, but the, the the best way to access um, is particularly the Farron stuff. It, a lot of it has been digitized and cataloged and is on our website. Um, and so if you go to our website, which is just www.doaks.org, D-O-A-K-S.org, and um, if you just type into the search garden archives, you will get a whole section that has not only um, historic photographs of areas, but also drawings, uh, also correspondence between Farron and Bliss and all kinds of other people. So it's, it's a pretty rich archive that we have. Um, and, and it's pretty accessible at this point digitally. So I feel really good about that. Yeah, I, that has really made a big difference in many of uh, our museums and public gardens. Uh, digitizing has been something that we've been working on quite a bit, and it made all the difference in the world during COVID. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we still have some ways to go. There are a number of historic drawings that need conservation work before they can even be digitized. And then, so it's going to be a process. Um, but but I would say of all the Farrand, I think we have about 5,000 items of, wow. and I want to say like more than three quarters of that is up and cataloged and digitized. So mm -hmm. it's pretty readily available at this point. That's cool. Her stuff that is not related to Dumbarton Oaks is at the U University of California, Berkeley, because mm -hmm. she donated all of her papers except for Dumbarton Oaks to, to UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. that, that's just great. So some questions about Forsythia. We have some fans of Forsythia. We have some mm, critiques of or critics of uh, Forsythia. So tell us about, do you know why she likes Forsythia so much? And do you have a propagation area? Uh, when's it gonna bloom? Yeah. So many questions. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, I mean, Forsythia, you know, it's, it's certainly not one of my favorite plants either. Um, but when you see it planted on an acre of steep, hillside it's 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 a pretty magical experience actually um for such a cosmopolitan plant it's really amazing when you're in it in that hillside especially when it's in bloom but even just when it's in leaf you just feel like you're in this magical wonderland with a waterfall just cascading down the hill and that's exactly why Farron used it um she even plant she, she talks about the architecture of the forsythia and how the stems should be spilling down the hill um and i think it's interesting it's one of the areas she she was so good with color everywhere. Every all her color combinations are so good. But the one area where I'm I'm not crazy about what she did is with Forsythia Dell, and it's right next to Cherry Hill. Oh, at the same time, and the cherries and the Forsythia, and it's it's not a great combination. But I think that it's because she wasn't really as focused on the flowers of the Forsythia. She really was focused on that form and the cascade and the the massive planting spilling down the hillside. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very effective. So, you know, forsythia is one of those plants. Um, it's a love it or hate it type of plant. It, uh, I don't find it to be, you know, invasive in the classical sense. Um, I don't find it escaping elsewhere into the gardens. Really, it's a workhorse. Uh, when we had to replant, I think it was four or five hundred forsythia that we replanted in there. Um, we just propagated them from from cuttings from that plantation. Uh, in our greenhouse. And then we also stuck just live wood cuttings 
correctly. <laughs> Gardeners actually made wattles to keep people out of those beds and they stuck wattles and all the wattles rooted and mm -hmm. back really quickly. Um, so yeah, but it is, it's, it's a, it's a historic design. We're committed to maintaining it. And um, I don't see it as really problematic, but. Uh, Personally, it's one of my favorites. My grandmother told me that for <clears throat> Cynthia, I, I was, the shrub was named for Cynthia for me. And then I was really disappointed when I went to school and realized it really, we really should be calling it Forsythia because uh, it was named after Forsyth. So, uh -huh. <laughs> but I still, I still remember that for, for Cynthia. So the color well, I, brightens. I challenge any of the Forsythia detractors to come to Dumbarton Oaks when it's in bloom and, um, and, 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 and try to walk away without a different, uh, appreciation of it. <laughs> yes. We have a question from um, a, a member that says various peer reviewed studies found no benefits to compost tea over basic irrigation. <laughs> Is this implemented throughout the gardens or only on the newer sand based soil mixes? I love that question. And I knew it was coming. <laughs> and I know what a charged issue compost tea is. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I don't even we don't even really talk about it as compost tea. We talk about biological infusions. Um, so I know there's it's all over the place and it depends on who you talk to. What we do, um, we brew it ourselves. Uh, we make our own compost in house uh, and um, uh, and then we um, we brew it ourselves. We, we, are, we, we use a microscope to look at the compost before we brew. It. And then we use a microscope to look at the, the infusion as it's brewing. Um, the time that we brew it is not, there's no set time. It's based on the biological activity. So we've gone through microscopy classes um, with our consultants and learned how to identify the good guys and the bad guys. And so, you know, we're mostly trying to encourage flagellates and um, uh, you know, um, basically predatory microorganisms that go after um, that go after antigens and that also help with nutrient cycling. And so, uh, you know, I challenge someone um, when you look at a drop of this water after after brewing for three days and you see the diversity of microbes swimming around and you mm -hmm. see the difference from day one to day three. Um, I just, it's just amazing at how much life uh, you're actually increasing just, you know, with with by providing food and air and, and, and a habitat. Um, so I, I think it does a uh, I think it does an amazing job. Um, we don't use it throughout the gardens. We may we use it on uh, plants which we're newly trying to establish, um, and then we also have been using it throughout the box, boxwood plantings because of boxwood blight. We've been spraying a lot of fungicides to try mm -hmm. boxwood blight, and this is a way to bump up some of the natural uh, flora in the soil that gets decimated with fungicide application. So I, I see a huge benefit to it. And we've looked at, at it under the scope and, and, and we, it's good stuff. Now I can't speak for if you're hiring a commercial applicator who's brewing it and coming to apply it. I think, I think the reason I feel so good about it is because we do it ourselves and we see what we're doing and what we're, what we're producing. And so I feel like it's a, it's a good product. Yeah. And, and they'll be, continue to have conversations about mm -hmm. that as everything in gardening, because yeah. it depends on your own experience with what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and we haven't done, you know, lab studies or anything. This is anecdotal, but, but we see a benefit and, uh, and it's something we can do in house and it's a relatively um, low hanging fruit for us to be able to, to do it. So. Mm -hmm. I still like the Chinese proverb that says the best uh, fertilizer that can be available is a gardener shadow. So uh -huh. <laughs> by just watching and taking care of your plants, you're actually uh, benefiting them more than anything else. So we have one more minute left. So one more question. What is the status of the oaks for which the estate was named, as well as Oak Hill Cemetery? Because those oaks are gorgeous. Actually, your cut sore tree is my favorite. <laughs> yep, that's a pre-bliss tree too. We, ha uh, we still have oaks. Um, we have one, I think one remaining pre bliss oak left on the property. I think everything else has been replanted since they came to the property in 1920. So um, we're constantly replanting oaks. Uh, I know oaks are having a lot of issues these days. Um, uh, we're mostly growing white oaks, um, some some con color, some bicolor oaks, um, but I just got Doug, Doug Talame's book and I'm interested in some of these smaller oaks and kind of diversifying our oak collection a little bit and, um, and adding oaks. We will always have oaks. I told my my boss will never have to change the name of this place. We'll make sure that we keep planting oaks. So, 
Good. Well, that's a great place to end. And I want to thank you, Jonathan, and I want to thank our viewers. Uh, it's been delightful to be with, with Jonathan and learn more about one of our local heroes, as well as be with you, just so that you can learn more and help out with our public gardens. So thanks again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Is really special. Uh, we have a woman who is a true uh, hero in uh, um, uh, women STEM uh, scientists, and she's going to talk about the art and science of soil, which is her specialty. And if you've heard, we're going to have about 180 orange sculptures in the Hopped Garden starting on March. Fourth, and it's all STEM women, STEM uh, engineers, scientists, artists, uh, all kinds of different studies in there. So please stop by, see us for that, and see our orchid exhibit. Thanks again, Jonathan. Hope to see you this year. It was my pleasure. Take care. Bye bye.